Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is David Sue. I am Chief of Staff at Jobs for the Future, a uh, national nonprofit in the education and workforce space. And I'm thrilled to welcome everyone to the panel today. We have a, a great group of folks, and we have a really interesting topic. So we're, we're going to be talking about policy, uh, primarily federal policy, although probably a little bit about the states as well. And um, we have a great group of folks, so I'll, um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Just by way of background, my, you know, I come out of the U.S. Department of Education before being at JFF, um, so I spent seven years there, and so I really believe in the power of policy, and I think that there's a lot that can be done there through policy programs, through grant making, through the regulatory apparatus, through the bully pulpit, so there's just lots of opportunity, and I think we're at a really interesting moment right now, and we'll see how that um, unfolds over the next couple of years. What I'm gonna do is ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves uh, with their name and title, just very brief, and then just give us a, you know, one word or one sentence or two about uh, how you're feeling about the state of policy these days. What's, are things good, bad, scary, optimistic? So whatever the case may be. So Michelle, maybe we can start with you. Hi everyone, I'm Michelle Siquedos. I am president of the Campaign for College Opportunity. We're a nonprofit advocacy organization here in California based in Los Angeles where I was born and raised. I'm a first generation college going student so I certainly believe in the power of policy uh, to expand opportunity. I would not have gone to college had it not been for financial aid and the kind of supports that I needed as a first gen student to be there. Um, the way I feel about um, policy today is maybe the way I feel in general, which is cautiously optimistic and hoping we don't mess things up. Speaking of messing things up, um, I, Elo Ortiz Oakley, I am currently um, a senior advisor to uh, Secretary Miguel Cardona in the U.S. Department of Education. Um, I'm on sabbatical from my other day job, which is Chancellor of the California Community Colleges. Um, and so it's a pleasure to be with the department. And um, um, taking on this role, I am clearly excited about the opportunities. There is, in my opinion, a once in a generation opportunity uh, with the president's agenda. Yes, I'm, I'm a little bit biased, but, uh, but it's because of this agenda that I feel so optimistic. Um, there's a window of opportunity. Uh, I'll speak more about that later, but um, uh, I think it's it's a great time to be in this space, in a place where we're thinking about um, particularly adult learners. Um, it's it's a great time for for those of us who have been uh, pushing in this space for a long time. Good afternoon, I'm Allison Griffin. I'm a senior vice president with Whiteboard Advisors. Uh, we work largely at the intersection of entrepreneurship and public policy. I co-manage our higher ed practice and come to the work of Whiteboard um, after 10 years in Washington, DC. I was a policy advisor to the US House of Representatives Committee on the Education and the Workforce. Um, and when I think about policy in this day and age, I actually also think about politics. And I think that um, we're in a really unique place right now um, at the intersection of policy and politics. And I think uh, what, we're, what we need to focus on is how to um, survive at that intersection and find ways to collaborate and connect um, across different interests in order to move uh, the country forward in support of all learners. Great. Uh, John Bailey, uh, it's going to sound complicated, but um, I am a fellow at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, an advisor at the Walton Family Foundation. So I, I split my time across three, three groups. We spent a lot of time on workforce issues, economic uh, mobility, and, uh, and also education, and a lot around sort of pandemic response right now. Uh, previously, I had jobs in the, the White House at the Department of Commerce, and also as Director of Educational Technology at the U.S. Department of Ed. Uh, and also helped uh, co-found Whiteboard Advisors too. So uh, great to be with you. I feel, uh, I feel like a sense of urgency. I don't know if that's like a feeling, but like a sense of uh, only because of just the enormity of some of the challenges out there and the need to quickly move a lot of sort of policy apparatuses to help people uh, get gainfully employed and stay gainfully employed and hopefully um, address some of the, the challenges we were seeing even before COVID hit with uh, challenges with automation and the need for upskilling and reskilling and making sure people had the skills needed for the good jobs that are out there. Excellent. Well, yeah, so you can see we have a, a great panel. I'm really excited for the conversation. Y you know, we were going to talk about, or we are going to talk about loan forgiveness and free college because um, those are 
topics that are on a lot of people's minds. But I think because uh, Eloy's got some really interesting insights about what the administration is doing these days, we wanted to actually focus on that at the beginning. So figured we'd turn the floor over to you, Eloy, and just give us a quick update on how things are looking in DC with the administration's plans and priorities. And then, you know, I'll ask a question or two, or the, or the panel might do the same. Sure, so I'll try to give the elevator version of the administration's plan, which is extremely aggressive. Um, uh, you know, as, as you all heard, um, the infrastructure um, uh, plan uh, just got done, which is a, a huge, was a huge lift, is a huge deal f for the country. And now they're moving on to reconciliation, the reconciliation budget bill. And in that is um, most of the priorities for the administration's higher ed agenda. Um, the Build Back Better agenda, as you've heard it referred to, includes the American Family Plan, um, which is primarily um, uh, increasing Pell, making a significant down payment on the way to doubling Pell, which is huge for low-income communities, communities of color throughout America to make sure that they have an opportunity to engage in higher education and be able to afford the cost, the true cost of education. Number two, um, free community college. And, and I know a, a lot of people have different reactions to that word, but this movement has been around for a long time. You know, uh, under the Obama administration, it kicked off as the America's College Promise. It's continued to grow. Places like California have the California College Promise. So it is a significant investment in community colleges, the colleges that serve the majority of Americans. Uh, and so when you hear free college, think about it this way. It is a direct investment in opening up greater access to Americans of all background through the colleges that accept the top 100% of students in America. That's what it is. And the third leg of this stool is $62 billion on the table for what it's called completion grants. And that is a direct investment uh, to support um, programs that help more low-income, first-generation Americans not only enroll in college, but complete college. So that, those are really the, the three legs of the stool that are front and center right now. There are other pieces to the agenda that the, the uh, president and the department will continue to work on. Uh, obviously, a key point here is sort of, uh, uh, I've heard it referred to as the pre-K to gray pipeline. Um, that is sort of this lifelong learning, you know, beginning with uh, two years of um, universal pre-K, uh, all the way through opening the doors to every American having access to higher education. So that's really what this is all about, and it's all about the recovery. Uh, ensuring that we can get more Americans to the point that they can have a good foothold in the economy. Uh, what we know about this pandemic and the economy that has arisen from it is those who have the highest levels of education attainment, those who, have, who already had access to wealth, have done extremely well. It's the whole reason California has a huge budget surplus. But those at the bottom, those who have had the least access to good quality, uh, education and higher education are struggling. Uh, and so that's what this plan is all about. Um, that's what makes me excited. We're having conversations. And, and think about this. This is the first administration. Um, I don't want to sound like a commercial, but this is truly a unique opportunity. You have a president who attended a public university. You have a first lady that teaches at a public community college. And you have a vice president that attended an HBCU. So the focus is on institutions that are broad access, that serve the majority of Americans. And I think for the first time, there's that focus. Not to take anything away from the most selective or rejective universities in the country, but now is the time to focus on those colleges and universities that help most Americans. So that's, that's sort of the, 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 the focus, the drive, and there is a real opportunity because this reconciliation budget that's on the table now while it is a huge price tag and there will be arguments over the amount of zeros, um, there is a strong feeling that something will be done here, um, that something will be done here. So it's, it's a great opportunity that uh, I hope that we all can lean into.
Excellent. Thank you. I do. You actually touched on one question I wanted to ask a little bit about, and then we can get to some of the policy stuff. But what made you want to go into the government? And I know that, like, you know, Dr. Um, I'm here Secretary. to help you. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Well, Secretary Cardona is, like, really inspiring. I've heard him speak a number of times, and he's great. Dr. Biden really, obviously, as you said, cares deeply about this. So what is it about the, the folks in the administration that made you want to go in? So, uh, Mio, I, I know several of you in, in the room, those of you who know me, you know, I'm, I'm all about, um, you know, the majority of Americans having access to higher education. You know, those Americans that have the greatest opportunities and the greatest access to, to wealth, they don't need me. Um, they don't need us. Um, I'm focused on, on, on those Americans and previous to these, those Californians that needed access, that needed the opportunity, that needed to, to have um, that foothold in the California dream, the American dream, uh, and that happened through access to good quality higher education. Whether public or nonprofit, you know, I don't care as long as it's quality, as long as it's affordable, and it's accessible. Uh, and so, you know, um, these issues were front and center in the Obama administration, I felt that we lost an opportunity over the last four years. We wound up fighting over who's accessing college rather than helping all Americans succeed. And so I feel that this is a unique opportunity. And it's really the only reason I decided to go is um, because I do see that there's an opportunity for those colleges and universities and organizations um, and nonprofits that are focused on this issue of um, helping those who have the least access to resources gain access uh, to a higher education. Great. <clears throat> are there other folks that wanted to offer any like reflections or observations about the, the sort of state of, of the of play today? So I'll um, I'll jump in. Uh, given this is a conversation about policy, um, I I think that. Uh, the administration, I'm, I'm really excited about the plan the administration has laid out. I do think, um, Eloy, what you've articulated is spot on in terms of helping Americans um, that have the greatest amount of need. I think uh, what I might, and this is getting a little wonky, but what I might disagree about is the process to get there. And you just mentioned the reconciliation package. And for those who are not um, natives of Washington, D.C., um, of, of, of some sort, um, you, you might not know that the reconciliation process is really a budgetary um, maneuver or measure. And it really doesn't allow um, both sides um, of an issue, both sides of the aisle to um, uh, debate or, or address um, policy issues that are at play. And I feel like we are considering a pretty significant investment in both the Pell Grant program, perhaps um, student loan forgiveness, uh, certainly free college, all the things that you just articulated that I definitely think are a, a way forward to help Americans. But perhaps um, the process to get there is not as uh, bipartisan or collaborative as it might be. And I feel like maybe what we were going to talk a little bit about today is maybe how to get back to that idea of bipartisanship and collaboration, particularly around the needs of um, the Americans who, who most need the help. Well, one thing I wanted to add is around the infrastructure bill. I think for everybody in this audience, one of the things that's pretty exciting is that broadband access is seen as infrastructure. And, I, and um, sort of for most of us in this room, we would be like, of course. But the reality is that quite a significant number of Californians and Americans, especially those who live in rural areas or in low-income communities, even in big cities, do not have access to broadband. And after the year and a half that we've just um, survived, um, the idea that students don't have access to broadband is like saying you should be a student but don't give that person a pen or paper because that's what a computer and broadband and Wi-Fi access is today. So I'm excited to see that. Um, it, I think the definition of infrastructure is much broader and appropriately so. Yeah, maybe just... Um <clears throat> sort of two comments. One, it's like we should celebrate that higher education is even being debated because often, often part of advocacy is just trying to get your issue like on the table. And so we're going to have like, I think a really rigorous and vigorous conversation or discussion about the best higher education policies to serve 
um, underserved students, the students that need it the most. So I, I'm, I'm su super enthusiastic about that. Um, I worry, like, uh, I, I do worry about some of the free community college and some of the free college proposals. Uh, the, the second part of the stool um, that was just discussed about college completion is really one of the pieces we have to sort of fix. That right now, only 49% of Pell Grant students end up completing a program. And so you, what you can do is sort of flood the system with a lot of money and steer students into programs that fail to complete them. And that doesn't serve the students well, it doesn't serve taxpayers well, it doesn't serve employers and communities well. And so that part, making sure that we're making not just free college, but better college and programs that are actually completing students with a degree or credential, super, super important. And second, we were just talking about sort of like potential future policy there's so much policy we need to focus on the implementation of right now. And I know we're, we're gonna talk a little bit about that, but as part of the American Rescue Plan, there's $350 billion that uh, Treasury is giving out to mayors and to governors that could be used for a whole variety of different workforce and higher education sort of needs. How do we make sure governors and mayors have the playbooks to use that correctly? There's $500 billion for a jobs training program that was announced uh, through Commerce, the Commerce Department. Uh, just two weeks ago. And again, I think a lot of folks at this conference don't know about these sorts of funds, but that's funds that are out there that need thoughtful implementation. And same thing on broadband. I am so excited there's $65 billion in uh, the current infrastructure package for broadband. There's also $3 billion out there in emergency broadband benefit, of which eligible populations are Pell Grant students. And that pays for monthly internet service as well as a device. The challenge is how do you help low-income uh, families and individuals and Pell Grant students know about this benefit and sign up for it? So I, I was just talking to the FCC two weeks ago and this is their biggest problem. is like, how do you reach people? Because if they're not online, you can't reach them through websites and you know, through targeted emails, right? And so it takes a lot of door knocking. It takes uh, institutions letting uh, the students know about these benefits. But it's one of these things where uh, we need more urgency in implementing these benefits too. Great. Eli, did you want to add anything? Well, at the risk of going down a rabbit hole, uh, you cannot flood community colleges with a lot of money. Community colleges are the least resource segment of higher education in the entire nation. You flood Harvard with money, and nobody complains about that. Uh, and that's why you have the results that you get. So in my opinion, I, I appreciate the concern. I think community colleges, um, open their door to the top 100% of students in America. No other system of higher education can say that. And so I think it is the best place to invest every resource that we can in order to get the majority of Americans the opportunities that they're looking for to be able to participate in, the econ in an economy that only those at the highest levels of education attainment can participate in now. So I, 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 I struggle when I, when, I, when I hear that, that, that we're pouring a lot of money into these institutions, but the reality is we are only beginning to make a modest investment to this proposal over um, decades of neglect for most of these colleges and broad access universities. And having worked with Eloy for over a dozen years now, what I would say is that in, in that statement, while I agree with you, Eloy, I think we both agree that community colleges have had to do a lot better at serving students and in particular addressing in inequity. And that's all of higher education, not just the community college system, but to have access is only a part of the deal. I mean, you know, as a first gen college student, nobody, well, we celebrated that I got into college, but the real celebration was the fact that I graduated. That was what was a game changer. You know, my first year out of college, I made as much money as my parents. And I know because I helped them do their taxes because that wasn't something they could do. And, and that was just amazing to me that they'd spent, you know, decades working in manufacturing and together their combined income was less than my income as a nonprofit entry level staffer. And so, you know, I think the game changer in higher education is definitely access and then ensuring that students are supported to complete. Um, Eloy has been a huge champion of that in the community college system, really pushing for a vision of closing equity gaps. Um, and I would say that's, the, that's what I want to see broader across the country, a real explicit focus, not just on saying we're going to serve low-income students or even the term underserved instead of historically excluded, which is what has happened. If, unless you're a white male, you were historically excluded from higher education in America. That's the reality. 
And so what are we gonna do to actually repair for that and provide the kind of opportunity and support that others have benefited generations from having? And, and I would agree with that, Michelle. And actually on that point, um, in the America's Family Plan, there, the free college piece is a state-federal partnership. In order for states to access that money, there has to be alignment of transfer. There has to be um, a recognition of uh, alignment between K-12 and higher education. And there has to be a focus on disaggregating data uh, to show that you, we're seeing progress across the disaggregation of data for student outcomes. So I think it is a step in the right direction. Ultimately, states need to be held accountable. Uh, that's the job of states. Um, and, uh, but, I, but I do think that that is an expectation that has to be there. Great. I wonder if we could just touch on for a few minutes um, the sort of those two topics, um, loan forgiveness and free college. And like John, to your point, like we are talking about them. It's like they're on like the national news. They're on the, the big the big topic. So how did we get here? And like why are we talking about these things? And is there any risk? Like are there things that are not on the agenda because those two topics are? How did we get here? Well, I think one, I mean, you had, you had a generation of college students that were struggling after the last economic recession, so back in 2009, that just didn't get sort of the immediate income boost and were sort of amounting and wrestling with debt the same time that, you know, they were in, it, it, was, it, was, a very, it was a very slow economic recovery. And so as a result for that, some of the new college students were just struggling to make ends meet, much less pay back uh, debt. And so that, that's part of the reason you started seeing a lot of attention given to income-based repayment plans uh, and other ways to help sort of students manage this mounting debt with all this sort of the income uncertainty they had. And so it's, it's great we're having the conversation. I, th I think one of the, the things I worry about with some of the loan forgiveness is that, um, you know, there's, there's analysis from Brookings or from some other places that uh, most of the loan outstanding balances are held by uh, folks that uh, are, are in top income earners. So I think it's like something like about uh, loan forgiveness under the plan, about uh, half of those loan dollars that would be forgiven goes to the top 30% of income earners. And so there's a little bit about how do we do loan forgiveness, but to folks that are really struggling financially and to low income students as opposed to a more regressive policy that actually sort of favors loan forgiveness uh, for upper income people. Um, I worry too, we're missing opportunities on sort of short term uh, solutions. And there, we just had a great debate uh, with the American, with the um, Endless Frontiers Act, which is a competitiveness bill that was gonna try to help make Pell Grants available for short term programs, a lot of certificates, and it could help with some of the other sort of training options that were popping up. That, that didn't get passed as part of that bill, and so I'm hoping that we can have a good, a good conversation with that. So it's, it's not just Pell Grants for two-year institutions and four-year degree institutions, but hopefully for some shorter-term programs that can get kids uh, and, and students and young adults uh, into uh, a gainfully employed program, too. I might um, also add what I think we are missing um, in the conversation around loan forgiveness or doubling Pell um, or new ways to perhaps cover um, the, the financial uh, commitment that students have made. I feel like we've lost sight of the conversation around affordability and the cost of college in the first place. And so, and maybe even the, the broader conversation around value and return on investment. And so I almost feel like it's, it's really hard to have a conversation about providing additional resource or forgiving resource if we're not going back and really examining why we're having that conversation in the first place. Um, uh, you know, thinking back 20, 25 years ago, um, you know, when we were, were talking about the cost of college and we had the College Cost Commission and we were looking at um, why, why college costs so much, um, both from an institutional standpoint, also in the public institution sector, you know, states disinvestment in, in higher education. And so I feel like in order to have this conversation about um, how we support our learners on the, or graduates um, or non-completers um, on one side, we also have to be having a conversation with our institutions and providers and our states um, about affordability. I would echo that sentiment. I mean, I'm not going to get into the department's position on, on loan forgiveness. That's an issue that's being debated in Congress with the administration. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, efforts to, to uh, land on what that's going to look like. But, you know, we have to take a step back 
and as was mentioned, how did we get to this point of two, three trillion dollars of student debt? And we, we hear the stories about, you know, graduate programs, uh, two, three hundred thousand dollars of debt, uh, and there is just no way those programs, those individuals are going to get the kind of earnings that is commensurate to the amount of loan that they took out. So there's got to be work done on the back end of this conversation about what is the accountability uh, for um, public, nonprofit, private uh, colleges and universities on um, you know, what kind of debt uh, that they're uh, laying on uh, to many of our students. And I think the, the students I'm most concerned about are the students that have debt and don't have a degree. And, and actually, you know, to your earlier point, right, if we look at loan forg forgiveness in terms of from an equity perspective, that's how you would look at it. You would eliminate debt for anybody that has debt and no degree. And then simultaneously, Allison, to your points, you know, we have to address multiple parts, right? There's been state disinvestment. When states don't fund their public higher education institutions sufficiently, higher education institutions raise their tuition and fees because they're going to get their money from one way or another. So you have to push for more funding for higher education. Simultaneously, there's for-profit predatory campuses that are seeking out low-income students so that they can pull in Pell Grant dollars, so that they can pull in potentially Cal Grant dollars, and provide a completely invaluable worth nothing education to students of whom most don't ever graduate or complete anything. And yet folks are making lots of money off of that. In California, we've passed policies to restrict access to Cal Grant. Um, the Obama administration attempted to do a lot of that. And there are folks that argue, hey, the free market and social entrepreneurship should allow this stuff to happen. And they don't care, you know, and, and we don't care. We don't collectively care enough that people are being screwed literally, for profit by, by other people. So I think there's multiple ways that we should be attacking um, real affordability and ensuring value for what students who are trying to get any kind of leverage to get ahead um, so that they can actually do it. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, I, it's the, the one area of agreement, the $60 billion for helping colleges with completion that should be just a no-brainer. Like there, there's there's a kernel of bipartisan support there because we just need colleges to work better Ac across the board. It's not just a community college problem. There, it, we have a bunch of four-year degree institutions that struggle to complete. Uh, the students that need the most help to complete a program and get that degree. And it's exactly right that the 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 worst thing is to leave college, stop out. Uh, have this debt and then not have the income boost that you get because you don't have uh, the degree. And so we need more funding and support for it. We need more sort of solutions. OB's here with Flourish Labs. It's doing some amazing work at helping to sort of track and measure and support students' mental health in the early days of like starting college so that they don't uh, hit, a, hit a rut, stop out, a stop out becomes a dropout, and then you have this problem with, uh, with students with, with debt and no degree. And, and we could also be doing more. Again, it's great use for the $350 billion, for the $500 billion of commerce. Like, how do we help identify these students that have some, uh, some college but no degree, and how do we get them back into college to complete a degree? So we've seen pilots with this in Colorado and Tennessee. We need more of that. We need to help people sort of you know, get to the, the last mile and, and make sure that they get a, a, a credential and a degree there too. So I wonder if we could also look at what's not on the agenda. There's like there's so much if you just walk around probably in this room or at this conference that's going on that's outside of the Title IV Higher Education Act dollars. So there's you know all the boot camps and the short-term programs that are not uh, eligible for financial aid. Uh, there's income share agreements. There's all sorts of new things like that going on. And I just wonder if there's if any of those conversations are going to come into the policy conversation or not because it does seem like they're often. Uh, at odds or they're happening in different places. And so I wonder if, if any of you have thoughts of whether they're gonna continue on parallel tracks or there might be some way they'd come together. Uh, you, look, from my point of view, uh, you know, there is certainly a lot of um, attention being put on the, re the recovery. The recovery is, is key here. And so how do you help most Americans gain access to some opportunity to upskill, to reskill, to get back into the economy. I think that's very important. So I think those conversations are happening. 
So how do you best do that? Uh, with the understanding that there has to be an element of consumer protection. Mm -hmm. And this administration is going to be focused on consumer protection. So I think what would be helpful is for you all who are in this space, JFF and others, to help inform um, Congress, to help inform the administration about what is working, what can help Americans, what is the right investment from the federal point of view um, in a way that is also going to ensure that um, um, you know, programs uh, don't leave students behind with debt and, and no real opportunity to gain access to, uh, uh, to the economy. I would agree with that. I, um, I think there is a, a delicate and difficult balance between um, protecting the, just the integrity of whatever category of conversation we're having about innovation or entrepreneurship or new ways of doing things and consumer protection. Um, I think you know, leaning too far one way or the other um, actually you know, creates a degree of um, uncertainty or perhaps even in uh, you know, chaos one way or another. Um, and I think that there is a way to balance the two. Um, but I also think that if we're going to go down the route of consumer protection and um, uh, the ability to incent innovation or support new ways of thinking and doing. Um, we have to do that across sectors um, and across tax statuses. And I think that some of the questions that we're asking, um, you know, whether it's the for-profit sector or the not-for-profit sector, we should also be asking the other. Um, and I think that that's how, we, that's how we move forward on an agenda that brings some new ideas, um, new ideas to the table. Yeah, maybe. I, I mean, I've always been, um, I've always liked the idea of income share agreements. And there's like a remarkable opportunity, hopefully with one of these bills, to get, there's bipartisan legislation sitting up in, in Congress that gives some regulatory guidance and guardrails and some student protections. Getting that just passed doesn't cost the federal government anything, but creates some rules of the road that hopefully can unlock another financing mechanism. The reason I've always been intrigued by income share agreements is that it addresses some of this consumer protection and some of the equity issues that we're concerned about, meaning the only way that institution gets paid is if a student completes the program and gets a job above a minimum income threshold. Then they get a percentage of that, the student's income for a percentage of year or for a number of years after that. There's something about having the institution have skin in the game that accelerates making sure the student completes and gets the highest paid job possible. And there, there's, there's imperfections and some, some other issues that definitely need to get addressed with income share agreements. But that's a financial, that's, that's an alignment of incentives that does not exist right now underneath Pell Grants, underneath uh, student loan products or other things. And I think it's part of the reason we have this completion problem and part of the reason we have some of the equity challenges there. So I keep wondering if there's a way to tinker with that policy mechanism and maybe use it, that if we're gonna double Pell Grants, if we're gonna do some of this, Maybe there's a way to build in the financial incentives and alignment to make sure that uh, those incentives are going to the programs that are completing students the most. All right, I have a whole list of questions, but we only have a few more minutes. So I wanted to just, like, in a little bit of uh, closing, ask each of you, you know, to give some advice to the room full of folks here. There's a lot of people who are entrepreneurs or funders or, or others. What would you have them thinking about right now? Or if they were talking to a policymaker, what should they be saying or thinking about? Are we going down the line or you Whoever. want us to pop corn in? Sounds okay, like so I have an idea. So my advice would be um, is to take a broader view on the, the problem we're trying to solve. And I actually think the challenge, or the, not even the problem, the challenge we're trying to solve is for talent. And I think if we... Um, stop thinking about talent in silos of K-12 and post-secondary and workforce and economic development and we think about what's that, what's that thread that we could actually pull through all of those conversations that ensure that 
for me, I live in Colorado. So our Coloradans um, are prepared for the workforce um, that, the, that the state needs, um, prepared for their local economy, prepared to support their family, um, are engaged in learning over their lifetime. Um, I think just reframing the way that we think about the work ahead through a talent lens um, gives us opportunity to work a little bit more collaboratively, perhaps, than we have across policy silos in the past. You know, I would just say there's an enormous amount of innovation in these rooms, enormous amount of ideas happening. And the, the question becomes, you know, how, how does that affect policy? Um, and so, you know, uh, if, if you have an idea, if you're working on something that's having uh, impact at scale, that's really um, helping more Americans from, you know, the lowest rungs of the economy have an opportunity to, to have an uh, increase in economic mobility, then I would spend some time sharing that with your local uh, representative from Congress or you know, sharing it with uh, local policymakers in your state, you know, raising these issues. Because that's, that's ultimately what um, the goal is here, is how, how, do, we, how do we solve for um, improving opportunities for those who have had the least access to opportunity? I guess I would I would add, um, Allison. I really loved your your thread, and and I do think that a lot of the challenges we face are the fact that we don't work together across systems, across you know um, across the workforce when it comes to higher education. Um, and I also think that we forget that our collective future really depends on whether we do what Eloy just said. Um, you know, I, I can appeal hopefully to the greatness in your heart that everybody should have access to a higher education and opportunity to go to college and live out their dreams. Probably most of us in this room have had that blessing. But also, what does the future of California look like when 70% of our residents are people of color and yet huge inequality by race exists in our state still today. And what does the future of America look like when that access to opportunity and to an education doesn't exist equally based on the color of your skin or your gender? Um, so I hope my advice would be that you would feel the urgency. I think a lot of these policy conversations are seen as like, it's a limited pie and I need to get my half as if, you know, we can't figure out how to appropriately share the pie. And I think that's what is um, frustrating, heartbreaking, I think, about policymaking is that we sort of see things as a zero-sum game versus we all want to live in a California that continues to thrive economically. We all want to live in an America that continues to provide opportunity and expands that opportunity for others. And I don't see how that exists if we don't address racial inequality in a more substantive way. Uh, great answers. I mean, I, I, just two other ones, I d double down on all those. One, we should thank uh, policymakers right now. You thank people like Eloy, because it is hard work. I mean, you have a once in a generation pandemic that is creating other pandemics. We have pandemics right now of kids not enrolled that have stopped out and, uh, and there's huge challenges, and it's exhausting to be a policymaker right now. And so we need to thank uh, policy people. Elor could be doing a lot of different things with this time right now, and so going in for service is amazing. We should thank him for that. Second, don't don't just wait for Congress to pass something. There's so much money out there right now that is waiting for good innovation ideas. Go and compete for that 500 million dollars over at the Department of Commerce. Go engage your governors to figure out how a portion. Uh, uh, of the 350 billion that they're getting can be used for some of these different uh, programs and for some of the innovation there. There's a lot of money waiting to be influenced with good ideas. Make sure you're just passing on those good ideas. Don't forget governors, don't forget um, uh, state leaders because there's a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of dollars right now looking for good ideas. You have the good ideas. All right. Well, thank you everyone for what was a really great conversation. There's lots more to do and say, but please uh, join me in thanking the panelists.